All right, zombies, still a popular source of entertainment. They just don't seem to get old. I mean, they do. They start to smell after a while and lose parts, but you know what I mean. So let's talk about zombie apocalypse. You know, the old fantasy that couch potatoes like to engage in, where they imagine that they would be one of the badass hero survivors instead of, you know, one of those. Maybe you have your own ideas to breathe fresh unlife into the flesh munching, brain slurping hordes. Maybe you have too many ideas and could use some help in organizing them better. I've got a sponsor for that. Campfire is a writing software with a number of tools to navigate the jungle of your own imagination. It helps you manage all the information about your characters, their backgrounds, the changes they undergo, when they'll start craving flesh, you know, stuff like that. Now, you can keep a neat overview of events in nested timelines so you don't forget when Barry needs to show up to prevent a Jill sandwich. In the world view, you can create maps and place images and information, link locations, etc. Wouldn't want to confuse the helmet key with the the armor key now, would you? You can choose whether you want all modules or only specific ones, whether you prefer a subscription or a one-time fee. There's a free trial and a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you're a writer or a game master, check out Campfire in the description below. I'm gonna spare you the whole uh, actually routine of rambling about how zombies wouldn't work in real life because without blood flow to the muscles, they wouldn't be able to function, blah, blah, blah. We'll just assume that it works somehow or uh, maybe they aren't actually undead. I suppose the most plausible version is probably the fungal type because there is something similar to that in real life where a fungal parasite hijacks the brain and controls the host, but they're not technically undead. And there already started to ramble about the thing I said I'm not going to ramble about, so let's just cut it out and cut to the chase. So how bad would a zombie outbreak be? It depends on a wide variety of factors, one of which of course is the transmission. Now, if there was an airborne zombie virus, we'd be fundamentally buggered. The past two years have shown how brain dead humans can be when dealing with a global pandemic. I mean, everybody would be dealing with it in their own way. Uh, maybe some would have a more proactive approach. First I said, yet another government hoax. Then I figured, okay, it's real, all right. But y'all are being pussies. You're just gonna get bit. And if you're strong, you ain't gonna turn. A couple of scratches and small bites and then your immune system's good to go. No big deal, y'all. And the weak, they gotta go. It's a law of nature, you know? And give the umbrella, umbrella corp some g goddamn tax breaks. They, they gotta get some tax breaks. You hear tax breaks. Others might focus on finding a cure. My aunt's brother-in-law's cousin became less alive, but after a few crystal healing sessions, she's doing much better now. Also, if you take the virus and dilute it in water until you have the equivalent of one particle per swimming pool, the resulting potion will not only fortify you against unaliveness, it will also slow aging and cure acne. Anyway, so obviously it's best to go with science. And uh, yes, there is actually scientific research on the topic of zombie outbreaks. Uh, in particular, an article published in 2015 in the interdisciplinary journal Physical Review E, Volume 92, Issue 5. You can run, you can hide. The epidemiology and statistical mechanics of zombies. Somebody actually did that. They came up with a simulation to show how zombies might spread. And of course, the point here is this applies to other infectious diseases as well. So you can get an idea of which areas are more vulnerable than others. So this is a grid-based population map where they simulate slowly moving zombies, which randomly move within the grid and uh, attack any nearby human, of course. Uh, the, the zombies move at a speed of one foot per second, which is 0.68 miles per hour, or 1.1 kilometers an hour. 
That's extremely slow. This is the, the really clumsily shambling type. To put it in perspective, that's less than a quarter of the average walking speed of people over the age of 80. If I check Google Maps and go one kilometer in any direction from where we live, it's between 12 and 15 minutes, and supposedly takes according to Google Maps. A zombie moving at this speed would take an hour for the same distance. So yeah, they, they are slow, what they're assuming there. They also assume that zombies are 1.25 times more effective at biting humans than humans are at killing zombies. That's a kill to bite ratio alpha of 0.8. Uh, that's based on highly scientific sources like uh, Night of the Living Dead and Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, movies. But what else are you going to base it on? And they decided the zombification time is two hours, which fits a lot of movies and also fits within the Resident Evil universe, uh, where it varies a little bit depending on transmission. If we go by the infamous Itchy Tasty Diary from Resident Evil 1, it took a few days for this guy to start developing strange behaviors and the initial infection was from an airborne strain. Uh, then if we look at Resident Evil 2, the truck driver in the beginning, it's hard to say but might be under an hour from the time he got bit to where he starts to act weird and lose control. And uh, then we've got Marvin at the police station in Resident Evil 2. Depending on how you interpret play time, probably a couple of hours, something like that. So two hours seems to fit in pretty well. So they came up with a simulator where you can set three different variables and you can place a single zombie, patient zero, anywhere on the map you want and then see how it goes from there. So it's based again primarily on the bite to kill ratio and the speed at which the zombies move. Uh, and of course, you know, it takes place in the US because as we all know in movies, the only important country in the world is America. So fair enough. Anyway, so whenever you place the zombie on the West Coast, it's much more contained and limited to the big cities, basically. Generally, of course, it depends on the geography and the population density. So if you put a zombie in a large city, then it, of course it's gonna spread like a wildfire within the metro area, and then it may slow down after that. But from the West Coast, it doesn't seem to really spread onto the East Coast or even toward the center of the country. Whereas if you put them on the East Coast, it goes and goes and goes. I did a couple of runs and it always ends up spreading slowly but steadily and it just keeps going and going and spreads in every direction until it has pretty much covered two thirds of the country or half at least. The problem whenever trying to come up with a model like that is how many variables there are which are really hard to account for. For example, if you think about the population, not every person would be equally susceptible and not everyone would be equally dangerous if turned into a zombie. For example, young children or the elderly would be easy targets, but they also wouldn't be as dangerous to most adults. Uh, if you think about particularly fit individuals, uh, you know, like power lifters or various athletes, you know, even CrossFit, I don't know why people keep mocking it, but hey, people who do CrossFit are generally healthier than the average person. So somebody like that who gets turned into a zombie would be more dangerous, but they also would probably have a higher chance or better chance of escaping zombie bites, things like that. So that, that's a little bit tricky. And uh, then also the transmission wouldn't be 100% reliable if it's through bites. Um, think of clothing, you know, summer versus winter huge difference or also geographically you know places like say arizona or mexico or whatever other places where it's just hot all year around and people don't wear that much more exposed skin means more chance to bite and infect whereas you know say winter most of canada where people are all wrapped up not so much uh, because even if a zombie is able to injure you, like for example, this jacket here, a zombie could bite me through this jacket and would hurt and it would probably cause a pretty substantial injury. 
but it probably wouldn't really transfer the virus. It probably, there wouldn't be any exchange of bodily fluids. Uh, whereas if they bit me on the hands or the face, they, they'd get me. So there would be some casualties without infection. And uh, over time, some zombies would be destroyed or disabled randomly, not just through interaction with survivors, but they could be falling off great heights, for example, or you know, running into environmental hazards, stumbling into them rather. Or if you think about accumulating tears in muscles and tendons over time, fractures, just things that keep adding up because zombies don't have a sense of self-preservation, they don't feel pain, they don't take care of themselves, etc. So they would over time be more and more damaged and less capable of going after survivors. You can't really simulate that too well, I think. And what about people's ability to successfully neutralize zombies? Now that depends on, again, a number of factors. You know, how many firearms are available or other weapons, what percentage of the population is in fighting shape, etc. Now, generally in a scenario like that, law enforcement officers are the heroes in movies. So how successful would they most likely be? Well, there's a study published in Annals of the New York Academy of Science, volume 1032, issue one, evaluating performance of law enforcement personnel during a stressful training scenario. So these were police trainees ready to graduate from the academy. In other words, fresh meat, you know, soon to be police officers. And um, the, there is a criterion of 70% of the fired bullets hitting the intended target. Uh, how many people do you think succeeded at that? Or rather, how many of them failed? Take a wild guess. 97%. So basically, everybody failed the goal of putting 70% of the fired bullets on target under stress. Also, 19% shot the hostage. So you can say, well, these are graduates. They don't have real life street experience yet, but I would think they probably have more training under the belt than active duty officers tend to engage in, which as far as I know, isn't all that much on a regular basis. So marksmanship may suffer some more. So what about real world numbers? We have the hit rates at the New York Police Department between 1998 and 2006, which was at a distance of over seven yards, 23%, uh, at a distance of seven yards or less, 37%. That's a lot of misses. And uh, the hit rates at the Los Angeles Police Department varied quite a bit over time. They were lowest in 2013, a measly 20%. And in 2016, they were the highest at 48%. So they increased it quite a bit. Why? They simply didn't shoot as much. In 2013, they fired 637 shots. And in 2016, they fired 145. So it's less than a quarter. Now keep in mind, that's all hit locations. So likely mostly upper body. If headshots are needed for zombies, yikes. Okay, but let's be nice. Let's assume super cops. Let's just assume everybody's Leon Kennedy or whatever. So let's say they have a 50% headshot chance uh, on a zombie. And let's say you need to double tap them to make sure to disable them. Both are pretty generous. With some zombies, you may need more than two nine millimeter rounds to the head to uh, make sure they stay down. But let's just say, okay, four rounds needed for every zombie. Standard issue firearm is the Glock 19, 15 round capacity. So 15 rounds means 3.75 zombies per magazine. Let's say they have two spares. So each officer could kill potentially 11.25 zombies. Again, that's highly generous. I think more realistic would be something like five unless they have more ammo on them, whatever. In New York City, you have 42.3 officers per 100,000 population. That comes down to 2,364 citizens per officer. So if we assume a quarter of them gets infected, that's 591 zombies 
per police officer. Okay, a quarter is quite a lot, especially when considering that the very young and the old and infirm might not be active threats as much. So let's just crank that down quite a bit. Let's say 10% of the population. Let's say it's still early on in the outbreak and not everybody is an active threat, whatever. That's still 236 zombies coming at each officer. And also that's assuming, of course, that the officers are all immune or immortal or whatever. All right, okay. Let's assume that the citizens, there are armed citizens that are helping out as well. So that, that just limits the number quite significantly. It's, it's, just, it's just 1%. Well, it's still 24 zombies against one officer. Yikes. What else does it depend on? Of course, the type of zombie. So here are the different scenarios and how they rank in my opinion. So in terms of danger level, I would start out with the Resident Evil style undead zombies. So the spread would be moderate, I would say. Uh, it's a relatively fast transformation within a couple of hours. But the problem with that is that it's not enough time to go far before full zombification. Uh, like they wouldn't, they wouldn't end up on any planes or ships or anything like that. You know how much time you spend at the airport, right? You gotta arrive early, you gotta check in, then you wait, you know, half an hour just to get on the plane, then you wait another half an hour when everybody is seated before it takes off. And of course, zombie transformation doesn't go bam like that. You start to get symptoms before, you know, an hour or two or whatever. I'm guessing probably like after, half an hour or an hour, you probably start showing symptoms. So they're not even gonna let you on onto the airplane anyway. And the undead shamblers are relatively easy to escape and evade. You have to do that pretty frequently in the game because you just don't have enough ammo for all of them. Uh, but they are relatively hard to kill. They are kind of bullet sponges and ideally you hit them in the head, etc., etc. So I'm assuming a transmission through bite. If we assume airborne transmission as well, which at least in the initial laboratory outbreak seemed to have been a thing, then this, the danger level would be bumped up quite a lot. The next most dangerous scenario would be like that of the 2004 remake of Dawn of the Dead, where the zombies are pretty similar to Resident Evil, but they are runners, which makes them very hard to escape and also hard to kill. So everything applies as to the Resident Evil scenario, but they're more dangerous because they're fast. Speaking of fast, the next most dangerous scenario would be like the one from 28 Days Later, the Rage Zombies. Now here you would have a major snowball effect because you have fast moving vectors, I guess, uh, infectious, and extremely rapid transformation. It happens within a matter of minutes. So as soon as somebody gets in contact with the, the body fluids in any way. I remember that one scene where a guy got a drop of blood in his eyeball and that was enough to turn him within minutes. That's extreme. So that's a severe uh, spread, you know, very quickly. Uh, practically no incubation period. Again, it's almost instantaneous, which means they can't get onto airplanes or ships or trains or anything. So they can't use any kind of transportation to get places, they just, their feet, that's all they got. So they're almost impossible to escape, especially in large numbers, and also harder to fight because they just don't move clumsily, they are fast and aggressive. Uh, perhaps they even have a bit of a strength advantage if they're constantly on adrenaline, yeah. So that's not good, but they're not as hard to kill as undead zombies. They are alive after all, and thereby they are limited by the physical restraints of living bodies. So in this scenario, you would have extremely high casualties and rapidly, but they would be limited in reach and in time as well, because hosts should expire within days and not starve. They would of dehydration. They don't drink as far as we see. So they, again, they wouldn't have any kind of self-preservation. They wouldn't take care of themselves. They would die within a couple of, of days. But 
if the momentum keeps going, if they keep infecting new people, then the spread is less them moving, but more just the infection moving along, rolling along, so to speak. So that's still pretty bad, but it is limited by how far they can go. You know, as soon as they hit less populated areas, if there are larger stretches that are uninhabited mostly or not accessible without vehicle, then it just stops there. What's the number one worst case scenario? That's what you've got in the Living Dead series and in The Walking Dead, where you've got a fast spread. Now, technically, the infection from a bite can take hours or possibly even days to kill somebody, but the problem is all dead rise and within minutes too. So you don't have an epicenter as such. Everybody is already infected. If you think about it, it's basically similar to the mechanic in Plague Inc. The infection needs to happen without immediate symptoms to be most effective because you want it to spread without countermeasures. And then when just about everybody is infected, then you want to mutate the nasty shit. So in this case, if everybody who dies rises as undead, you're in a world of trouble because people die every second, you know, across the world, all around the world of all kinds of causes. So everybody rises everywhere. It's a huge problem. There's nowhere to go. It doesn't matter how remote the place is, people die everywhere. I mean, assuming once again, that really absolutely everybody rises. I think in The Walking Dead, it was in the water. Uh, in uh, the Living Dead series, it's just whatever. It could be magic or, you know, some supernatural cause. So these are reasonably easy to escape because it's the shambler type, but there's going to be very large numbers, of course, and they're hard to kill, at least in The Living Dead. In The Walking Dead show, Less so because they have unnaturally squishy heads and apparently just about any brain damage will take them out, which I've talked about that before. It's not plausible. You would probably have to destroy specific parts of the brain. It would cause a lot of other problems as well. You would have damage to buildings and infrastructure, of course. I mean, we've seen how COVID disrupted supply lines. Just imagine a zombie outbreak. You would run into problems of you know, food shortages, medication, all the, the essential necessities of life would be lacking as the population size goes down. Uh, I guess that becomes sort of a balancing factor, but either way it would be a major problem, obviously. Okay, so finally, I just wanna talk about the, the most uh, plausible in real life, most dangerous scenario I can think of. So that's a virus that doesn't make people undead. It doesn't raise them from the dead. It just turns them into rage zombies, basically zombies, quote unquote. So and you have two ways of transmission in, in this scenario. One is airborne and it causes asymptomatic infectious hosts with an incubation time of let's say a week or more. So again, the plague ink thing. Yeah, like you, you keep spreading the virus a lot before even the first symptoms become apparent. And uh, then the second transmission is through bodily fluids. And there you've got the full transformation within minutes or a few hours. So, you know, why would there be two different modes of transmission for the same virus? It could have to do with the viral load. You know, if it's airborne, you may not get as many virus particles in your system. Whereas through saliva and blood, you know, that gets into your bloodstream, the viral load might be higher and thereby cause different effects. But even if you don't buy that, even if you say there's only one transmission method, then it should be airborne. And uh, then I guess a couple of days, you, you have to figure out the right balance between it taking long enough for people to be able to travel, but not so long that you, you have big gaps between infection and zombification. And of course, then the zombies would be, um, if it's airborne, the zombies would act a little bit differently. I guess they would just try to get to you, grab you and just, just cough in your face. 
we kind of already have people who are like that in real life so i guess it's kind of plausible maybe they would projectile vomit on you or, or something nasty like that. that that would make some sense and i'm not done yet it would be affecting all mammals so imagine hordes of infectious killer squirrels mice rats raccoons hamsters cats dogs etc uh, that would be bad news anyway let's just leave it at that this is, this is gross enough so <laughs> hope you found us entertaining uh, thanks for watching and have a good one folks stay safe don't be stupid bites and scratches and fucking <laughs> fucking whatever the fuck I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm some fucking yokel come on y'all umbrella is doing a bang ass job they gotta get some tax breaks like don't you want to get them the bioweapon profits tinkle down on us huh you just gotta get with the program once you pull yourself up by your bootstraps then you can just close your eyes and just feel them tinkle down on you. It's it's like a it's like a warm golden shower. Dude, you want to get some gold, don't you? Just just, just let, them, let them tinkle down. So it's nice. Yeah. Zombies, my ass. Just a damn conspiracy to come take your guns. Because, you know, if if. if they're zombies, then you gotta you gotta have more guns. So the government then comes in, and, and they take your guns. So they have more guns to to fight them zombies. Hi, how's it going? You got some brains.